from WSL Pure, this is One Ocean. Hey everyone, today, among other things, we'll learn how and why baby fish are eating microplastics, what life forms are hiding out in ocean surface slicks, and what's most affecting the health of our coral reefs. That's a lot to cover all in one conversation, but our friend Jameson Gove, who is a research oceanographer with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, or NOAA for short, is the perfect person to discuss all this with. Jamie has a PhD in this stuff. He's got a ton of field experience under his belt, and in the past year, his work was featured in National Geographic with some of the most stunning imagery of the microplastics surrounding larval fish. Little baby fish, tons of plastic, not good. He's also just a great guy and a great surfer, and a fun story, I actually met Jamie on my very first couple days on the job. I was on a work trip to Hawaii, and I bumped into him while surfing with a buddy. We kept in touch over email, and as he published more and more research, I knew I had to get him on the podcast and just learn more from him. So I'm really happy to have him here today to share his knowledge with us. Without further ado, here's Jamie Gove. So here, here we are I'm with Dr. Jameson Gove. Yes. And um, you're an oceanographer, but I feel like that's a pretty broad title. And, you know, really, I, I don't like to bucket people into just your title. So how would you define yourself? You know, who, who are you? And, you know, what are you doing here on this planet? <laughs> uh, way to start broad and, and um, uh, some important questions out of the gate. Uh, oceanographer is a pretty general term. You know, people study open ocean, people study the Arctic. And in my case, mostly I've focused on coral reefs. Uh, so trying to understand how ocean processes like waves, temperature, current, so on and so forth, influence coral reef health, mostly thinking about coral community structure. So different types of corals, different types of algae, how they live, where they live, and uh, thinking about around islands and between islands across the Pacific. So I'm kind of more of a biophysical oceanographer where I look at how ocean, the ocean conditions dictate marine food webs and coral reefs in particular. That seems like a pretty linchpin area of study right now in particular, like pretty core. I, I mean, not that there's, we should be ranking science as this is more important than other science, but, you know, understanding our world and those, those changes and how the ocean, because the ocean is changing so rapidly right now. And then what is that going to mean for the rest of those? What are those cascading effects? It feels like that is just urgent, urgent science that we need to understand as soon as possible. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. A, a lot of climate change manifests itself in just um, subtle changes in current conditions, right? Uh, whether subtle changes through time or actually more acute, really extreme changes like, say, a marine heat wave where ocean temperatures are, are you know, quite a few degrees um, above average for an extended period of time. So, uh, like I said, it's it's when I started my career uh, in ocean science, I'd, I wasn't really intending to focus on climate change, but uh, climate change is just is just now um, just a fundamental aspect to the research that we do. You kind of can't avoid it, right? No. You know, it, it's just there and it's affecting everything. So that it's whether you're whatever you're working on, it's going to affect that science in yeah. some way. I feel like. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think uh, historically we've really put things into two categories, uh, natural fluctuations in the environment and human activities. And so a big part of my career, I was uh, studying islands, remote islands without people. So the remote Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or Papahanaumokuakea, there's some islands on the equator. The U.S. actually owns quite a few islands throughout the Pacific, largely vestiges of World War II. Um, and it, actually, even before that, we used to... Um, uh, go down to certain islands and mine for bird guano, uh, basically for phosphorus and, and nitrogen for fertilizer. So to make a long story short, the U.S. just owns uh, or, or has territories um, throughout the Pacific. And so working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, uh, we're actually responsible for doing baseline studies and monitoring these reefs throughout the Pacific. And so, you know, throughout um, my 20s and into my 30s, I was doing a lot of scuba diving in these remote areas, trying to basically assess what these reefs were like and, and um, how they were changing and, and so on and so forth. And what I noticed early on is that reefs in different geographies uh, looked very different. The corals looked different. The amount of coral looked different. Um, the type of fish were obviously different. But but I think uh, it, it was sort of a firsthand experiential education in that different... Um, 
variations in the physical environment really dictated what reef ecosystems look like. And then you would come to a place like, say, Oahu or some other really heavily populated island, and the reef would look entirely different, uh, especially compared to what we would expect based on the natural environmental conditions. And so if, if historically, if we would study uh, these more remote islands as a natural laboratory, we could kind of really understand how the physical environment uh, dictates and structures core reef ecosystems. And if we took that knowledge, took that that model and, and applied it to, say, a place like Oahu, where where things deviate from that, we can know that it's likely human activities that are, that are one that are driving those changes in, in core reef health. And so what's what's a little bit different now is that even in remote islands, climate change is actually fundamentally influencing uh, ecosystems. So this sort of natural laboratory is now an interesting um, experiment, so to speak, to see how climate change is even influencing some of the most remote ecosystems on the planet. Yeah, that's super interesting. I mean, we've talked a lot about the concept of shifting baselines with some of our other guests. And, um, you know, you're touching on that point of, you know, you, you had this place where you could get a baseline, but now that baseline is going to be continually changing and changing really rapidly. So now it, it, it inhibits your ability to, um, understand that place and then use that data to understand our places where we exist. Yeah. A fair summary. Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) shifting baseline. Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, that's, there's, there's all sorts of research about how, you know, people's perceptions of what ecosystems used to be and should be it definitely shifts with generations and and certainly that's a big part of you know we we don't know what ecosystems look like at least coral reefs anyways um you know hundreds of years ago right so we're we're forced to to look at remote islands and, and say that these are likely what ecosystems um look like in the absence of local human impacts but now there's global climate change happening right and so what what it does for us on uh, in terms of uh, our research and our science it, it allows us to look at the impacts of climate change. So, for example, it, uh, really warm ocean temperatures, which will drive coral bleaching, uh, which, you know, we can dig into in, in this conversation if you want to. But, uh, you know, we can look at that in a remote island and then look at, at an island like Oahu, and you can we can try to understand how e- local human activities uh, will compromise or undermine the resilience of reefs to climate impacts. So we can compare those remote and local and and so it still provides um, a really an important aspect of our research to 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 compare uh, what and how humans are are disrupting or influencing um, ecosystem processes. But nevertheless, it's uh, it, you're you're right. It's it, climate change and its impacts are 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 pervasive and prevalent in, in all aspects of what we do. Yeah. So I, I definitely want to dig into the coral stuff because you've been doing a lot of work on that in this past year. Um, and it's super relevant just to <laughs> our community of ocean lovers and surfers. And, um, so if you had to say, what is a, what does a healthy coral reef ecosystem look like? And what is a unhealthy human impacted reef ecosystem look like? Right. You know, what, what are those few things? And maybe let's, let's use Oahu as, as the example, um, you know, what's going on here that's impacting the reef. Cause I know you've done some interesting stuff with, runoff from the wild pigs and the the the, the uh, soil that washes down the river and then affects that local reef ecosystem so maybe you can give us a couple examples that are relevant here or that are common to um, many areas right uh, beyond the, beyond climate change itself sure. <laughs> which is just affecting all reefs everywhere with warming waters and the bleaching itself so um, what are those other impacts, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So if I go on some <laughs> random tangent or down some rabbit hole, feel free to bring me back and back to what you actually want to get at. This podcast, it's long form. <laughs> go, right. go for it. We have an hour to, to get through this. Uh, so I think your first first opening part of that was, um, you know, juxtapose uh, what a what a nice, healthy re- ecosystem looks like. Yeah, at a high level. A, yeah. So, you know, when I visual and, and of course, um, different geographies, uh, look differently just because there's different species and, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, but when I think of a, a healthy reef ecosystem, I, I see lots of, lo- lots of coral cover. So thinking about in the ballpark of at least 30, 40, 50 and upwards of 80%, um, coral, uh, everywhere you look. So 80% of what you see is, is, is dominated by live coral and, and there's lots of different shapes and lots of different colors. And so some shapes are, you know, more mounding and encrusting and low lying and other ones are more, you know, um, structurally complex is what we would say. So there's lots of holes and other things, the branching sort of branching, so on and so forth. Yeah. 
And, and the reason why that structural complexity um, is important in a, in a healthy reef ecosystem is what is it allows for fish to basically hide from predation. So the more structurally complex a reef is, it provides more habitat for all sorts of different types of fish. So really like at the physics level is surface area. The more surface area pockets and kind of exposed pieces of the reef, the more habitat for fish, the more fish, the healthier the whole ecosystem is. Exactly. Um, and then also as part of a reef ecosystem, it's not just corals. Uh, crustless coral algae is actually, uh, it, while an algae, it's, it, it is encrusting and it, it is calcifying and it provides sort of the glue of, of this reef ecosystem. It's, it, 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 um, it's this bright, usually bright pink and, uh, and it's also CCA is, is what we tend to call it, but crustless coral algae is, um, is really fundamental for coral reef to settle. So a, a new coral larvae will come down and it can really only settle and grow on existing crustless colon algae. So it's a, it's a part of the ecosystem as well. And there is a healthy amount of, um, of what, you know, tends to be negative, but fleshy algae, you know, a lots of parrotfish and other things eat fleshy algae. So there has to be some fleshy algae for food source for those fishes. But also what is a, I think a hallmark uh, characteristic in a lot of remote ecosystems is just the amount of fish biomass. There's just fish everywhere and they're big and huge schools of them whether that's you know especially up in the northwestern Islands, there's just giant schools of 100 pound plus alua and wow you know schools of 80 90 150 and then just lots of sharks sharks are definitely uh, um something i would say is is really a, a part of, of remote ecosystems uh, so you now sort of describing what the opposite of that would be is you know, you look out and you kind of see mostly flat, uh, maybe a couple of small little coral, you know, nubbins here and there, but mostly mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a really pavement like substrate with, with sort of algae, uh, slowly moving back and forth as, as you know, the waves go overhead, very little fish, um, just no color too. It's almost like everything is just kind of like murky green, brown color. Yeah. And those are, those are clearly the extremes of the spectrum. Yeah, uh, for know, sure. You know, it's not like everywhere around, uh, and I don't want to keep picking on Oahu, but it's not like everyone on Oahu is, is like that by any means. But but a heavily impacted, heavily degraded reef has very little structure, is pretty flat, very little fish. Um, and so... I mean, images that I've seen of, of reefs like that feel like a graveyard. Oh, absolutely. Not to get too dark, but <laughs> they just feel yeah. like... Oh, there was once life here and now it's all gone. It's, it's like the darker scenes of finding Nemo or something, you know, right. like, <laughs> whereas like the healthy reef ecosystem that Nemo's from is this beautiful, wonderful place. Yeah. Um, lots you know, of color. You know, and sometimes you'll see, you'll still see lots of old dead coral. So some of the structure is still, is still there in some of these places, but, but, um, you know, and I, basically after a coral dies, it, while the structure will stay there for some time, it slowly also degrades. Yeah. So now what are those causes? What are those things? What are the top few things that, uh, you know, in this local, um, ecosystem are, are affecting the reef, you know, beyond. So we're, we're saying, okay, climate change is happening everywhere, warming ocean bleaching, but, um, runoff for example, or sunscreen, do you classify that as one of the bigger problems, um, fishing and, and those impacts? Like what are those top three to five things that are affecting our local reefs? here say in hawaii and then maybe are more broadly applicable that are affecting sure. all reefs yeah and i think i've used this term a couple of times but i'll refer to these things as local human impacts or local human activities and that just is really the things that are you know we are doing on a day-to-day -day that that, are, that is directly impacting the reef you know within our local geography within a couple of miles or, or whatever from from um, uh, societal infrastructure or, or what have you uh, I would say that, you know, the top, there's really top three, I'd say that are most important. Uh, wastewater is is a huge issue. It's a huge issue in a, in a lot of uh, developing countries in particular, but but even in, in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, waste wastewater pollution is is incredibly detrimental to core reef health. And what I mean by that, and I, I don't know how many, how, how common knowledge this is, but a large portion of the Hawaiian Islands use cesspools as their primary um, way to deal with with wastewater and accessible you know I, i'm sure that you know but it, it's really just a hole in the ground right and so all of our wastewater goes in that hole and depending on uh, how the proximity of your house to the ocean uh, a lot of that leaches out into the environment so while the solids may stay in the cesspool 
um, all the nutrients, all of the other, all the other um, bacteria and so on and so forth will will basically hit the groundwater, and then the groundwater is the delivery system to to the um, nearshore environment. So a place like say the Big Island, which is a fairly new island, it's very porous, lots of lava. Uh, that connectivity between the cesspool and the groundwater and then the groundwater to the, the ocean is is um, really quite fluid. So there was actually a study where they they put a bunch of dye, um, biodegradable dye tracer in a bunch of cesspools and septic tanks and so on and so forth uh, in this community. And in one particular case, within about six hours, that dye hit hit the reef. And in that Six ca- hours? Six hours, Hang yeah. on. So, okay, so in the cesspool... Uh, science sci- is, are these NOAA scientists or just uh, this is actually scientists from uh, the University of Hawaii at um, Hilo. So a biodegradable dye in the cesspool, and then in six hours that hit the reef. Yeah, and that and that was a uh, un- interesting, unique case where the it was actually a septic tank, but the septic tank was cracked. Okay. Um. So, but I think uh, the total the the range in time was six hours to about 10 days. So even 10 days is still... That's still fast. Super fast. And so what we would say... There's a lot probably of, a lot of nutrient loading and there's there's a lot of nutrients in there still when it's that fast. Yeah, right? exactly. It's not filtering out the way it's supposed to. No. Uh-uh. You would um, The way that the process is supposed to work is that a bacteria will come in and break down all the solids and 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 deal with the nutrients and so on and so forth but it, but for this example uh, basically those nutrients are just are hitting hitting the near shore. And, and I guess we should talk about why nutrients are bad. So, well, hang on. I also want to know the range. How far is the range? Uh, you, so you, you have the time range, but how far does it go? So if, from a given cesspool, is this, is this reaching, is this affecting just that near shore reef or does that spread out? Oh yeah. Good question. It, it, uh, probably depends on what we would call the residence time. So how long water sticks around in a particular geography, and that really changes on day to day and and season to season. So in the winter, when there's lots of waves, you know that those nutrients would would basically be, uh, you know, they would be taken away pretty quickly. Uh, but most of the time, and in this particular case, uh, off the Big Island, and, and this is West Hawaii specifically, um, there's just not a lot of waves. It's a pretty stagnant environment. You know, it's yeah. just tidal currents and so on and so forth. So uh, it has huge impacts on on that local reef. Wow. Okay. Sorry, I cut you off. I just was curious on the, the, the range. What were you saying? Well, I was just going to say, like, I, I think most people, you know, think of nutrients. We maybe think of fertilizer and we, you know, obviously fertilizer is really important for agricultural production and so on and so forth. In, in this case, you know, reefs have, a, have really amazing checks and balances in a, in a natural system. And, and so what we're doing is we're basically throwing off those checks and balances. By, by loading up nutrients in a particular location, you there are only certain species that can take up those nutrients super and they and they grow quite fast and and those tend to be algae. And so algae will will really respond. These are weedy species. These are the weeds that are in your yard that grow you know within <laughs> days of you mowing your lawn, right? Like yeah. so it's the same on the reef. There are weedy species that that grow super fast and and they'll capitalize on those nutrients. And um, and so what they can do is they can overgrow corals. So they can outcompete and overgrow corals because they have this competitive advantage because of the excess nutrients, right? While corals need nutrients, they just can't take it up and they don't grow nearly as fast as something like uh, an algae. And then, uh, so that's the wastewater um, part. And then I guess flipping um, to uh, another issue, which is overfishing. And so there are a number of fish on a reef that eat algae. And so they put that that algal growth in check. Um, but the problem is, is we tend to fish the fish that eat the algae. So parrotfish is a good example that eat some algae and, and there's lots of other fish. And so I, um, what we're doing essentially is, is sort of fertilizing our lawn, but then throwing away the lawnmowers and still expecting, <laughs> still expecting our lawn to look pristine. And that's a, that's a really good analogy. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we're eating the lawnmowers. Yeah, well, yeah well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, that's, so a lot of these, um, these issues, these, these impacts do not, they don't, um, they don't work in isolation. So they're, they're, they're off, often synergistic in terms of their impacts on the reef itself. Right. So waste management, waste management issues and, and overfishing issues, um, combine to, to sort of, again, be this either additive or synergistic impact on reefs that, that is, is pretty detrimental. Wow. Anything else? Uh, so yeah, I talked about, um, on the impacts 
uh, yeah, so we talked about wastewater, wastewater management, uh, fishing. Uh, in certain areas, uh, sedimentation and other types of runoff, sedimentation is really just basically soil getting into the environment. And so there are various ways in which excess soil can accumulate on land, and then obviously a big rain event will come in and and transport all that soil to the to the water. And why that's impactful is because reefs uh, are photosynthetic. Well, corals are photosynthetic animals, and which sounds and is somewhat contradictory. Um, <laughs> well, because they're a plant and animal yeah, together. Yeah, they corals live in a symbiotic relationship with a single-celled algae called zooxanthellae, and the zooxanthellae. These are microscopic things. Millions of them live in the tissue in corals, and they provide corals their color. Actually, these are these are the, these are the um, blues and greens and, and purples that you see underwater, right? And so corals really have evolved to to rely on those algae, and those algae photosynthesize, and the byproducts of their photosynthesis, which is just really sugar, is what corals use as their primary food source. And so that relationship is really critical for their survival. So if in this case, we we're talking about sedimentation. If there's a ton of soil that is either in the water suspended or it settles out on top of the coral, it will inhibit the ability for those algae to photo photosynthesize and therefore provide the food to the coral. Right. So that's kind of what was happening with the wild pigs, right? Oh, right. So you're referring to, uh, we did this this video like Kyle with Tierman. Kyle Tierman, yeah. yeah, which is pretty funny. We're running around a field trying to, trying to hunt pigs and having a cameraman <laughs> running around. Uh, it uh yeah so pigs um the way that they feed they they basically stick their nose into in and turn over soil trying to find wh whatever they're trying to eat whether it's roots or worms or whatever and so and you can see i think anywhere hiking around here specifically you'll you'll see these just large stretches where the soil is just all turned over you know and uh and so what they've done is is unpacked the soil and so as soon as it rains all that comes down the watershed and comes out so they are incredibly invasive um and and are very actually detrimental in where they where they are yeah i mean the images from that video make it really clear when you see all that sediment covering a whole area of a what looks like a bay and of course no light is getting through to a reef there yeah no and definitely that, not and that's just like one example of the way that that can happen another one that i heard of a while ago was i think it was in papua new guinea um loggers were coming in to log the rainforest and the logging um, essentially uproots all these trees and then you have all the soil. So then when it rains, it just washes all out and just completely kills these reefs, which otherwise are really pristine. And so it's a pretty gnarly situation. Um, and I believe Wild Ark is a group that was doing some work to try to protect that area uh, to prevent that from happening. Because if you can prevent it, then hopefully you can keep that reef intact. And so it's just a, it's just a great example of you know how intricately our ecosystem is tuned, right? I mean, one effect on land, we think, oh, what's the big deal? It's a pig on land. Isn't that a natural thing? And it's like, well, is that species supposed to be here in the first place? <laughs> Which in this case, no, right? Yeah, uh, no, they are introduced. Non, yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. so, um, you know, then now that impact is affecting that whole reef ecosystem, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, uh, land sea connections are are really important for thinking and, and studying, in this case, coral reefs. I mean, un understanding what we would call land-based sources of pollution are, are really a, um, a big driver for coral reef ecosystem health. Are, are there marine sources of pollution? Yeah. Aren't, isn't all pollution land-based? I always find it funny when we say like most plastic pollution comes from land. It's like, well, it all comes from land at some point. It's just whether it left a ship or it came off the coastline. <laughs> no, yeah. No, I, that, <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. I'm, that is a good point. Uh, yeah. I would say, you know, most, most of the pollution that would be impacting um, marine ecosystems is, is certainly land-based. That, that's not all the case. There's obviously, you know, ships and, and fuel, um, being either spilt overboard or, or whatever, you know, there's, there's certainly other marine based, um, pollutions, but I, I think in this case, if we're talking about coral reefs and we're talking about nearshore ecosystems, it's largely based on what's from land. Um, and your original question asks, what are some of the other, uh, important factors influencing reef ecosystem health? And, you mentioned sunscreen and I think sunscreen is, yeah, I'm curious like how highly that rates. Cause I know that it gets a lot of attention from consumers and there's a lot of movements of you use reef safe sunscreen and I'm generally on board. Sure. We should be using better, more natural materials, but is that something people should be really concerned about or no? Yeah. Um, the answer is, uh, I do think people should be concerned about. And, and I think that, um, I look at sunscreen as sort of this, uh, 
gateway drug to caring about reef ecosystems. You know, I was really surprised how the sunscreen, um, the, the well, really that people recognized that sunscreen could potentially impact reefs. And then very quickly here in Hawaii, it, you know, it was passed in the legislature that we were going to ban, you know, this particular compound that's in sunscreens. And, so cool. And uh, it was just amazing to me because there was not a lot of scientific evidence to to back it up. There was, there was really just a, a couple of papers, one really important that basically showed that, um, you know, those, those specific compounds in, in sunscreen would, inf- would disrupt reproduction in corals as well as, um, basically cause coral development to, to impede and, and, and there's a couple of other issues too. Um, but I, I think that even the scientific community was a little caught off guard because I don't think we fully understood the, if you scaled up to say an entire Island or the, say the Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands in particular, like, you know, I don't know that we really fully, uh, could quantify the effects of sunscreen on that. I think my, you know, based on the evidence I've seen and, and, you know, my scientific opinion is that the, in spe- in certain areas, like Hanama Bay or certain areas where there is just a ton of people in the water all day, every day. And, uh, the, you know, the residence time is, or, or the, you know, how the flushing rates or how well in the water is, is there. Um, you know, if the water's really not being flushed regularly and there's a lot of people, it's, it's certainly a big issue there. Yeah. Um, you know, more remote areas where there's not people getting in the water and, uh, you know, sunscreen's not affecting those reefs, for example. Yeah. But it's also like, why not just use the better alternative? Well, the, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. That too. Like, yeah. No, absolutely. And, I, and I'm and I'm all for it. Like, yeah. you know, I think it's, I think it's, it has basically put the impacts of the things that we do, even as, even, you know, as subtle as putting on sunscreen um, and thinking about what it means for, for marine ecosystem health. And I'm, I think that's a huge, uh, huge win, really. So another good gateway drug, so to speak, in ocean conservation are single-use plastics, right? Um, the straw movement, the cutlery movement, all that, um, you know, and again, Hawaii uh, leading the way with Bill 40, which is super exciting that that passed. Um, so impressive and so, such great work done by so many groups in the community here on, on the island. Um, but, you know, the straw movement is similarly like that's not the biggest problem in the ocean, but it has resonated with lots of people and it makes them think about their day-to-day use of single-use plastics. But the, the broader plastic issue is massive. And you've done some research on this as well, which is really, really cool. Um, the imagery that was in national geographic, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, so maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. The, um, it, the imagery has been striking for sure. Uh, and, and just to take a step back, the, the fact that, you know, uh, Oahu just just banned single use plastics was a huge huge deal. A lot of people, um, Sustainable Coastlines, a lot of other organizations put a lot of effort into that, and you know they deserve you know as well as the legislatures that actually voted on it um, deserve to be recognized because it it is a big deal for sure. A hundred percent. So I mean, Surfrider Oahu, Surfrider generally was supporting um, Kukua Hawaii. I think there was like a zero waste Oahu group, um, Sustainable Coastlines, of course, and you know you saw the way the movement just exploded and um it was really cool to see how many people were still there at the hearing late at night waiting for the vote to come through and then celebrating when it finally happened right you know that community really deserves a round of applause from the global community because we need these examples to then say wow all right well they did it in hawaii why can't we do it in our community right and that kind of domino effect and so we want to see more of that so yeah huge shout out to all those people yeah yeah absolutely Hey there, if you're like me and you bike to work every day or you travel a lot and like having that perfect blend of comfort while still looking good, then our friends at Outer Known are here to hook you up with a discount on their C jeans. C stands for social and environmental accountability and these jeans really take that to the next level. C jeans are made in the world's cleanest denim facility. It's solar powered. It uses a closed loop washing system to save water. The jeans are air dried, saving even more energy. And of course, they're made from organic cotton and they're guaranteed for life. So if they wear through, Outer Known will repair, replace, or recycle them. If you need some jeans, men's or women's, hit up OuterKnown.com, enter the code OCEAN at checkout for 25% off your full price order on C jeans or any other items. That's OuterKnown.com, O U T E R K N O W N.com. And remember to use the code OCEAN at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today. Tons of styles. Outerknown.com. And don't forget, promo code OCEAN for 25% off. All right. Back to our show. Um, but, you know, getting back to the 
the sort of recent research that you're referring to. So we, we, um, and, and the sort of gateway, the gateway drug of, of <laughs> plastics into, into, you know, thinking about plastic pollution in general. Uh, yeah, you know, plastic straws are probably pretty minimal compared to, you know, many of the other plastics that are getting into the, into the waterways and so on and so forth. And it's, and it's impact on marine life. Um, but you know, if it's getting people to think about it, uh, the same way that re sunscreen does and, and makes, you know, they're making changes based on that, then, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, so we, uh, recently published, uh, an article looking at how, uh, larval fish are ingesting marine plastics larval fish being baby fish yeah so larval fish are are fish in their first you know zero to maybe 15 30 days of life and so so sub sub five millimeter kind of like microscopic we're probably going to take a little deep dive into to refish ecology or fish ecology 101 real fast and then slowly and slowly uh zoom back i'm Um, ready for the lesson okay (laughs) well I i think it is important so most fish, uh, you know, they, they, they spawn and they, you know, sperm egg, eggs come together, obviously, and form a fertilized egg. And, <laughs> and those, the, the birds and the bees. The birds talk. and the bees, yeah. <laughs> and, and those eggs are, are mostly buoyant. So most, most fish end up having buoyant eggs. And so even if they're living in a thousand meters of water, uh, a lot of fish have buoyant eggs. And so they'll come to the surface and those eggs uh, hatch, for lack of a better word. And so in a, in a larval fish pops out and they're incredibly small. They all like, they are about maybe a millimeter, Mm -hmm. um, super small, but they grow quite quickly and they're, they're at the surface. They're wandering around trying to basically eat and feed and grow as fast as they can until they reach some, some size, some age. And it's, you know, like I said, it depends on the species. It could be a couple of weeks or it could be a couple of months. And typically they're in the ballpark of 10, 20, 30, um, millimeters. And I wish I actually had something that I could probably bring up that would be um, comparable size. But uh, I mean, my, you know, my pinky nail or, you know, maybe the first kind of tarsal, metatarsal. (laughs) Now we need a human physiology lesson. I never took anatomy. I don't even know. (laughs) So I know that head of a uh, eraser of a pencil, I think is like five or six um, millimeters, for example. What are pencils? Do we use pencils anymore? (laughs) I know, that's another good point. (laughs) We're terrible at this. Uh, The lawnmower analogy was really good, but anyway. Okay, (laughs) so going downhill. We'll find another one. All right, back. Comparisons. So so baby fish. Yeah, and so, and these fish, like I said, once they get big enough or whatever, they'll they'll go back to the reef or they'll go back to the deep ocean or they'll go back to offshore. And, um, and so that's, that's what a laurel fish is. It's, it is basically, it's a baby fish, right? And, uh, that part of their life, um, it 99.9 percent of of fish don't make it they most most of them die most of the eggs don't either hatch or something eats the eggs and then once they are hatched most of those most of those guys die immediately um they can't find food they're in the wrong place something eats them whatever and so um surprisingly very few fish actually make it obviously and obviously enough make it so that there's plenty of fish you know in 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 the sea so to speak but um but yeah so what we were doing, our original part of our research was there's there's just not a lot known about that part of a fish's life cycle, it, the larval fish stage, where they go, what they're doing, who they're hanging out with, and and what they're feeding on. Um, we know some of those aspects, but we really don't. It's it's kind of a black box, which is surprising because if you think about uh, the survivorship of those fish, that really determines the future populations of adult fish, right? Uh, as well as just all all aspects of the marine food web really rely on the survivorship and the productivity of um, larval fish. And uh, I mean, uh, to to jump to the um, to jump to the the point of all this is that what we found when we were doing our research is that larval fish are surrounded by and ingesting plastics at their most vulnerable life history stage. And uh, when we started the work. Plastics was not the focus of the research at all. When when was the start of the work? Uh, we started doing our first surveys in 2016. So okay. we did we did um, summertime surveys a couple of couple of weeks over on the Big Island, 2016, 17, and 18. And you were just trying to understand better the larval fish stage. What's going on there? What why do they survive or not, et cetera? Yeah, there had been some papers um, back in the 80s and, and early 90s um, identifying some of these small scale ocean processes that might uh, contribute 
to larval fish survivorship. And so, but no one had really gone out and done a bunch of sampling to, to try and figure out where it, or what is the nursery habitat? You know, where, what are the larval fish nurseries in, in, in the near shore ocean? And so we were trying to determine that. And, and that's, and, you know, like I said, most of our focus was going to be on larval fish and figuring out what food is there and, and what their concentrations were and what the diversity of fish were. And, and then just over and over in every single sample we took, we kept finding plastics. And I don't think I was, I wasn't naive enough to, to, to think that there wasn't going to be plastics, but it was just such an overwhelmingly, um, dominant part of our, our samples that, uh, it, it was unavoidable. We, you know, it, it really sort of, a lot of our, our, some of our research really diverged into, into focusing on that part of it. So with the research, are you, are you doing a trawl with like a, a mesh net to collect some of the larval fish? Or when you say you're finding plastic in the sample, are you finding it in the surrounding water or are you finding it in the fish themselves? Good question. Uh, both. So if, <laughs> great. If you, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's, <laughs> I was if, afraid of that answer. <laughs> yeah. We were focusing on these things that we call surface slicks. And if you look out on the open ocean, and you see these sort of narrow, meandering, ribbon-like features on the surface that actually look slick compared to the surrounding water. Uh, these are natural ocean processes, and the reason why they look so it's not like oil or something from a boat. It's... No, it's actually there. It's um, they look slick because uh, the surface ocean is actually converging in them, which means is there's there's a really subtle, slow surface current that that brings things together in that slick. And so what it does is it, it concentrates food at the base of the food chain. So phytoplankton and zooplankton. Phytoplankton can secrete different biological material that are called surfactants, which is a term called uh, surface active material or agent. And what that does is fundamentally uh, change the surface tension of water. So it it looks slick because of these, these biological um, uh, lipids and, and other sort of oils that they're secreting. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So the physics brings it together, but it's the biology that, that really changes, um, changes the look of, of, of the surface ocean. And, and surfactants are, are things that are in like shampoos and, 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 you know, we have like synthetic surfactants soda or whatever. Right? Yeah. Cause like, that allows like you to wash your hair and allows the soap to actually get to your hair and so on right. and so forth. So, so it fundamentally changes the, the surface tension. So it l- looks slick cause it dampens uh, wind and wave ripple formation. And so these things are all over the ocean. I think if, you know, if anybody flown into coastal California or even here, um, you know, you'll, you'll look down as right before you land, you'll, you'll see a bunch of them. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking of how many times in my life I've seen that exact thing and not ever thought, and I'm just like, Oh, it's just current something or other happening. You yeah. know, I mean, I've flown over plenty of oceans. I've sailed enough. I've seen this. Exactly. But I didn't know that, that that's what it was, is that it was the phytoplankton, these microscopic organisms secreting a surfactant. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's a physical <laughs> mechanism bringing together basically a, a bunch of floating biological material. So it's its own little ecosystem then. Absolutely. And so that's what we were doing is we were studying that little, little small little ecosystem. And what we would take a, a net and basically tow it through the surface slick uh, for about 500 meters. Um, which took maybe eight eight to ten minutes going pretty slow, like two knots. And then we would do the same sample just outside of the slick nearby so we could have a control, compare what's in the slick versus what's out of the slick. And mm-hmm. we did that a hundred times um, over the course of those three years. And uh, and then we basically counted everything that was in the slick in the samples and then counted everything that was out. And what we found is there was just a lot more phytoplankton, a lot more zooplankton, and then over eight times more larval fish in these slicks and not only were there more larval fish but they were bigger and they were more well developed which implies that they're really benefiting from the increased food that's in these slicks and uh there was also just a crazy amount of diversity so uh, you know in summary we we really sort of were on the fact that these things are larval fish nurseries that um that you know a lot of larval fish are, are trying to find these things and 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 stay in these these surface ocean features so that they can eat and and uh you know get strong before they can go back to a reef or go back to an offshore you know we found mahi we found swordfish uh we found you know like i said a bunch of goatfish a bunch of different types of fish and a quick side note uh, a baby swordfish is probably one of the cutest things i've ever seen in my life it is it is (laughs) so it is really cool looking it's you know think think about like less than smaller than your pinky but fully developed it has a giant you know it has a bill 
so you know it has the it, you know it has the dorsal fin that that can come up and uh and you know we caught one and it was still alive actually and and we put it in a tank and tried to keep it alive as we as long as we could but everyone on we were happened to be on a ship and everyone on the ship from the captain to the engineers usually engineers don't care about anything that we're doing i mean t- everybody just came down <laughs> engineers to see, get such a bad rap i but. mean yeah i mean they're obviously important to keep our ship running but um but yeah they don't typically care about the science that we're doing and uh you know everyone came down to look at this like small little small wow. little, yeah that's so, I mean, they, fish. they are kind of unicorns, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there are very few of them yeah. slash like, it's amazing that they actually are even a real thing. Whereas, you know, unicorns aren't whatever, but, um, it's so funny cause last night I had dinner, dinner with, uh, Ethan Estes, um, who we worked with a bunch and we were talking about swordfish and different fisheries and tuna cause he's done tuna research. And, um, we were talking about how you shouldn't eat swordfish and the different methods to catch it. But he did say that they are the most magnificent fish he's ever seen in, in the ocean. And I've, I've been lucky to see a wild, uh, swordfish once on oh, a wow. sail. Um, I sailed from the Caribbean up to Massachusetts, uh, to, trying to bring a friend's boat back up and, you know, we're miles offshore crew of four people, 43 foot little boat. And one morning I'm at the helm and you know my crew crewmate uh, on watch is asleep everyone else is asleep down below it's early 5 a.m or something and we're cruising along and all of a sudden i hear this like, <laughs> like some kind of weird noise that shouldn't be happening and i'm kind of freaking out because it's only a couple days into the sail and i look back off the stern and there's this big 10 foot black ish you know figure and it was the swordfish going after our um we had a little uh hydroelectric um motor oh, basically wow. yeah. and it, it was attacking it it t- total full on with with its bill basically was just going whack whack trying to hit the thing and it did it a couple of times realized it wasn't food and then took off and i just sat there stunned and later on i was like guys guys and they're like no way whatever and then when we pulled up the motor because it was a plastic uh propeller it was all chewed up <laughs> it was a mess oh that's a great story yeah i've i've um i know a couple of people that have been diving and seen seen them in in the water but i've, I've never seen them i've never done any really? sort of blue water diving like that yeah know. yeah so anyway so back to really you, cool back to you so swordfish are rad and swordfish uh, are rad um yeah. And, uh, I think where I was at was, you know, we, we basically just found that there are a lot more larval fish in these things. And, and so what, you know, what we think is happening is there, because there's so much more food and food is super important as this part of their life history that they're targeting these, these ocean features to, to feed and develop and, and until they're ready to, to move on. Um, and because, uh, the, the underlying physical mechanism that derives the formation of these surface licks is 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 basically bringing uh concentrating things on the surface ocean it's also concentrating really anything that's passively floating and buoyant and so a lot of plastics are 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 buoyant and and so lots of small pieces of plastics are, are basically are congregating and aggregating in these surface slicks and and uh and yeah so every sample we we found there was there was you know just a, a ton of small pieces of plastic and and small being like a vast majority were five millimeters or less. Yeah. So microplastics technical definition is five millimeters or less. Above that is macroplastic. Um, I'm curious, what was the percentage found in the fish? Yeah, I, I assume you're doing a biopsy of as many as you can. Yeah. Or some yeah. representative sample. Turns out trying to dissect something that's about ten millimeters <laughs> is extremely difficult. <laughs> and then trying to find what's in their gut is even is even harder. Yeah. So we manually dissected um about 658 fish about uh, that's a pretty exact number <laughs> that's true uh yeah and you would remember that number because dissecting that many fish is yeah, not that fun so 658 exactly wow. um and we tried to you know just to to um to be able to compare different species we you know we we did well we did nine different species and we did um all about the same size range and we found in total, we found 42 had ingested pieces of plastic. And so, but we, what we did find is that there was over a twofold increase in the larval fish that ingested plastics that were in slicks compared to out. So interesting. Yeah. And so 42 doesn't sound like a lot, um, but I think it's important to contextualize this number with the fact that just because we, um, well, I guess what I should say is it's possible that we don't, let me take start this over. We don't really know the impacts of plastic ingestion by larval fish. So it's possible that they eat a piece of plastic and die immediately. 
So it's possible there's a large proportion of fish that are ingesting plastics that are just that were gone and we miss them, right? right. Um, so we kind of think it's a conservative estimate, but it's also you know we we counted in over twelve thousand fish, but we were only able to dissect six hundred, you know, a little over six hundred fifty. Right. So I think yeah, I think our results are are somewhat preliminary in the sense that it, I think that the issue is probably much bigger than than you know I think we're just scratching the surface because I think. What we're trying to do is develop methods so that we can stick a bunch of fish in a jar and basically dissolve them and then just leave the plastics behind. Yeah. It turns out that that doesn't exist right now um, in terms <laughs> of, a, of a method. And so eventually we're going to be looking at you know thousands and thousands of fish and to be able to really hone in on this number. Yeah, We did, um, I sailed with the Five Gyres Institute uh, who do microplastic research. I sailed from Bermuda to New York and we would trawl, you know, same sort of methodology and yeah it is it is the same yeah it's it's the it's the manta trawl on the surface what we would call a neustonic but top okay. top one meter top one meter yeah yeah um so you know we'd end up with a couple occasional trigger fish or you know small organisms and we'd cut open whatever you know unfortunately didn't survive the trawl um you know kind of a consequence of science but we'd cut them open and the number i think that we hit was around 20 to 30 percent had plastic in them um, so these are slightly larger cause we didn't have the ability to do the tiny stuff, but, um, you know, that's, that's enough that it's shocking and alarming to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially when you highlight the fact that, you know, we might not be seeing those other organisms that are, you know, passing away sooner. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, just a couple other things about that is that, um, what we, what we found is that there was 126 times more plastics in these slicks versus just right next door, you know, a couple hundred yards away. Wow. And is that because of that surface tension? Do you think that that attracts in yes. some way? Yeah. So that's a, that's a great uh, question. So what I think is happening is obviously it's um, because the ocean current is coming together. It's bringing everything together in, in that, in that ambient area. Um, but also, yeah, it's sort of, there's a stickiness. So uh, a lot of plastic are potentially sticking together either because of, of all of the phytoplankton there or, or what, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's aggregating and concentrating those plastics. And then we did compare the densities we're finding in slicks compared to what was recently published about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And that's where we found uh, average concentrations were about eight times higher in these slicks than, than what's in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, to be fair, wow. to be fair there might be small-scale processes in the open ocean, in the garbage patch that's concentrating, like, you know, the concentration is not uniform in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch by any means. Sure. Nor does that mean that everywhere in West Hawaii is, or everywhere in Hawaii is eight times more. It's more just, I think it's, it provides perspective of the amount of plastics that are where these larval fish are hanging out, you know, just to, just to contextualize those numbers. Um, it's just a lot. And, and I think the other thing that's really important that we focused on in a, is that it's, you know, it's not just that they're all under five millimeters. It's it's the fact that a lot of these plastics are less than a millimeter. So really small. You can't see these. You look out in the open ocean, you can't see them at all. Even walking on the beach, you can't really see these. These are grains, size of grains of sand. But larval fish, are the their food source is what they prefer is about one millimeter or less. So a vast majority of the plastics we're finding in these things happen to be the same size uh, as as their prey. And what was even more interesting is that a lot of uh, zooplankton, which is this is what larval fish like to eat, a lot of the zooplankton that live on the upper ocean, they're blue. They've adapted to basically try and um, as camouflage, right? So that they avoid predation. And a lot of the plastics that we found in the larval fish were all blue or translucent. So they were either looked blue in the ocean or they were actually blue dyed. Uh, and the other kind of fascinating thing is that they were all thread-like, like small little threads. Mm -hmm. And so the primary thing that larval fish feed on are copepods. And copepods are these, um, anyways, these small little animals that have antenna. And the antenna, we think maybe they're confusing the, the plastic threads for the antenna of a copepod. And, oh, and interesting. Maybe, so, I mean, those are all which is hypotheses at this point. We haven't really tested those right. things. But, um, you know, there's the, the fact that 93 or plus percent of the ingested plastics were blue or translucent and thread-like was um, was pretty striking. Seems significant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one thing that I take away from speaking with you is all the nuance to this. And I think that's something, you know, when I speak to scientists, proper scientists, they'll always say, well, like, it depends. And, and this number is shocking, but here we need to put it in context. And that's so important 
but we live in an era where we want very clear yes or no. What do I do? What do we need to do? Like we, we as humans are so media saturated, our attention spans are shorter than ever. And we want the very clear, like, this is the thing, (laughs) right? Like that's the thing. This is the bad thing. That's the good thing. There's a garbage patch and some kid's going to clean it up and great. And, you know, we kind of latch onto these very simple stories. So I have a couple questions. One is, you know, do you find it hard to communicate the work you're doing? How do you communicate the work you're doing? Do you get to? And then in the broader spectrum of the world and, you know, you you work for Noah, but you as an individual are an ocean lover and live here and all that. So is it challenging knowing all that you know and being in this era where people need to understand so much more? Do those questions make sense? Yeah. I mean, I- <laughs> I, I think I, you know, science communication is a, is a whole field in and itself. And, and I, I, funny enough, like, you know, going through graduate school, my master's and PhD, there was no real focus on communicating your science to the general public. Just do the science. Yeah. Just do the science and it'll get out, you know, so uh, you can probably judge me how well I'm communicating my science. Now I feel like I just got deep into the weeds on it for a little bit. No um, judgment. You're doing great. <laughs> Uh, it's a safe space here on the One Ocean podcast. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think it's incredibly important, and I think it's I, I personally feel like it's a part of my job. So you know, talking about what are the implications of larval fish ingesting plastics? You know, do we? It's possible that plastics may sort of impact the entire food web. It's possible if plastics are, even if a small portion of those larval fish are dying, that that has real ramifications for adult fish populations. And so bringing it back to us. Obviously, adult fish populations are really important for just basic ecosystem function. But, you know, whether it's livelihoods or for sustenance, we rely heavily on the marine environment and, and fish. And so, you know, these this has real world implications. And, I, and so trying to, you know, package that and message that appropriately, uh, you know, is, is challenging for sure. Because, you know, it, there are a lot of things we don't know about it. Um, and so you, you, you definitely don't want to oversell or, or overstate some of this, you know, especially as a scientist, I'm always going to be conservative in my statements about, um, the implications of the research, right? It's just, it's, it's part of our nature. It's, you know, it's, it's who we are. Um, so, but, but yeah, just translating to something that's, that's relevant and people care about. And I think that's really important. And, and I, and I try and, and do my best in putting energy into that and improving, so to speak, you know, um, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> oh, it's just... Oh, working for Noah, being a... So, yeah. So, I was also asking about, um, you know, and hopefully, being in the kind of government space, but then personally, you know, having a passion for the ocean. And you surf, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, so, like, you, you have a vested personal interest and, um, you know, we're in this time and era when, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people have been ignoring science for a long time and, you know, all that. And so, is it challenging to be in that? that space where as a scientist you're like hey we need more research this is nuanced i don't want to overstate things here but maybe personally you're kind of like we got to do stuff you know let's go oh yeah Uh, it's a it is it can be very conflicting um personally and internally because uh, you know i i think personally i have a lot of passion about a lot of these issues and i am you know i'm in the ocean all the time whether it's surfing or swimming or I mean, there's a reason why I live on the North Shore of Oahu. I mean, it's just, it's not coincidence, you know. And and so these are things that I am really passionate and I care about. Uh, you know, at the same time, my uh, I've decided that the way that I approach that is very much from through a scientific lens and, and trying to produce and focus on scientific research that is um, – that is scientifically robust, but is societally relevant. So I really, it's really important to me to be doing research that that matters for policymakers and management and and the general population. So in this case, the plastics research on larval fish, uh, you know, I, I was I, I hadn't expected how many people would be really interested in it, and and especially, I you know, just as a side note, this um, I was at a I was at a meeting at the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources down down it's a it's a state department and uh this woman came up to me and said hey you know i I just submitted some testimony for for house bill 40 the the plastics ban on oahu and i used your research as as part of that testimony and that was like just so validating and so really you know it was out of all the things that have happened through this through this work and getting it out it was one of the most important things because it made me you know um 
getting kind of all emotional about it right now. It really, it, it just really hit home that like this is work that matters to people and that it is relevant to our, the issues and the, and the concerns that we have and that we're facing today. And, and like I said, that just is a, is a, is a really important aspect of, um, of what I do and why I do it and, and a main driver. That's so cool, man. I mean, you should get emotional. That's a really proud <laughs> yeah. moment. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, to have your research be a part of that testimony to pass really progressive legislation to protect a place that you care about. That's really powerful. Yeah. So, you know, conducting societally relevant uh, research is, is, is pretty much all that I focus on. Fortunately, I have a job that allows me to do it. And, and bringing it back to your question about Noah, you know, Noah is in the business of trying to sustainably manage our marine resources. And so, you know, you need solid science to be able to do that. And, and so I feel pretty fortunate to work for an agency where that's a part of their mission, um, part of our mission. And, um, and, and so it's, it's provided me and afforded me lots of opportunities to, to feel like I'm doing, um, meaningful science. I think NOAA is one of the greatest things that, you know, this country has or has produced as an agency and institution. Uh, I mean, we rely on that information in so many ways that we don't even think about. And I, I feel really fortunate. I recently got to go to the Pacific Marine Environment Laboratory for their five-year planning, their strategic planning session. They brought in all these different stakeholders. And I was like, I don't belong here. I'm not, a, I'm not smart enough to be at this table. I was sitting next to like NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory scientists and all these really, really brilliant people. Um, and I'm kind of sitting there going, what do I have to do here? Um, but I was blown away by how important so much of the work that Noah does across the board underpins so much of the research we have in our understanding of the world. And, um, it really just hit home, uh, you know, whether it's your local tide charts or, you know, fisheries management, et cetera, Noah just does such, such incredible work. So I, I like just have this like incredible respect for the organization writ large. Um, and I think it's great that the organization is, you know, enabling people like you to do this research and get out there and then talk about it too. Cause I think that's the biggest thing is we need to be talking about these things. We can't just do the research. I, I think I, I hold the opinion that I get it that as a scientist, you have to be conservative and do the research and kind of be like, all right, this is just the research. But I think we're moving into an era where communicating that is more important than ever and communicating that in a way that breaks through, uh, particularly is, is super important. Yeah, no. And like I said, I, I actually, I think that, um, an older generation of scientists, um, would probably shy away and, and feel like, um, speaking to the media or speaking to the public was, is definitely not a part of their job. And if anything, it, it might be, I don't know, showboating or, or something perceived as a negative. And, and I think that the younger generation of scientists, it's, it's the opposite and I'm probably somewhere in the middle, but, um, but you know, I mean, I feel like it's part of my job and I think it's really important because at the end of the day we are, at, I mean, to, to, to put it down to the most basic level, we are a tax, you know, payer based funded entity. And so the taxpayers deserve to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Right. So, um, in addition to like, I think we do really important, uh, work on really emerging and, um, you know, global issues. And so getting that work out there is, um, critical for making policy decisions or just allowing people to, to really rally behind a particular cause that they care about and that, that maybe having some scientific, um, basis or backing is, is helps support that cause. Uh, you know, I think historically science has been apolitical, uh, and, and certainly we as scientists are as you know, in, in our occupation and what I think is slightly different these days is that science has become very political and, uh, and it's sort of people maybe believe or don't in science. And I, and I, <laughs> it seems the use of the word believe relative to science is yeah, always funny. It's directly conflicting. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so to put it bluntly and, um, and so I, that is a really, uh, it's challenging because I, I have a hard time, you know, say it's talking about climate change, which is, you know, there's never been an, a, a scientific issue in the history of, of society that more scientists have been on board with um, understanding that, you know, humans are directly contributing to uh, the fact that our climate is changing, right? And so yet the public, there's never been such a discrepancy in, in public belief in, in, such, in, in that you know, in a scientific finding or, or scientific evidence. And, and I find those really striking, um, comparisons or, or statements cause they don't really, they, they seem to be at odds with each other. Right. Um, so it, it, there is some challenge in, in the way that we communicate and who we communicate to. And, and, and just for the sake of there's now a belief system that seems to, um, I don't know, uh, 
get in the way of, of scientific findings, or at least um, put turn a blind eye to, to some really prevalent and, and pretty obvious scientific research. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I'll say, I don't think it's about the science. I think it's about the people who are, um, <laughs> you know, trying to work in the communication side that are working against your science that, you know, the science has been clear uh, for a long time. Um, and all the industries knew and everyone knew it's just that everyone covered it up. So, you know, I'd say keep doing the science and then hopefully there's more communication of it that helps influence us. Um, what else, what else is on the radar for you? What are you most excited about in the year ahead what's coming up what's what's new and, and, and what are you stoked about in 2020 uh well new, any new research or other projects or? yeah i'm like personally you know i'm doing some traveling I'm, yeah. <laughs> um yeah it's any it, surf it, trips it is uh i do have a surf trip do you take surf trips when you live here i mean or do you do you go just like snowboarding or something because you have the best waves in the world right here no that's that's true but um there are still plenty of there's you know traveling and and there is something really um i don't know exploratory and romantic about traveling for surfing still of course. so you know yes i still take some surf trips nice um you know it is it's, this is going to be sound kind of strange but while it is a difficult time i think for society to be to be um you know within the context of climate change you know it's it's a it's a it's a giant threat to marine biodiversity and human health and, and all sorts of aspects of, of our planet, including us. Right. So it's, it, there, it is, um, it is difficult, like thinking about humanity within the context of climate change, but as a scientist, things are changing in ways that we've never seen before. And so there are lots of things to study to try and really understand the impacts of climate change. And so, um, to say it's exciting, sounds like I'm excited that the climate is changing and that's not the case, obviously, but I think that there's a lot of research, there's a lot of doors, um, and, and a lot of needs that, and a lot of questions we need to ask and answer to fully understand how, you know, in, in case of, in my case, how core reefs are, are impacted by climate change. And, um, and there's also, uh, there's lots of emerging technologies being applied to, uh, core reef ecosystems and, and really, um, trying to understand those changes that, that just haven't been there before. And so, for example, we're able to really use uh, remote sensing techniques. So looking at either data collected from aircraft or satellites in ways to be able to see underwater and just see individual coral heads now uh, that we couldn't do just a couple of years ago. And the reason why that's important for people is that if, you know, we've only been able to study underwater um, ecosystems underwater since the, really the advent of scuba and scuba diving is really only been around since the 70s and 80s for people like me for scientists um so we don't really have just a rich history in understanding core reef ecology as say people who've been walking around forests for hundreds of years trying to understand you know differences whether it's vertical changes in in the tree line or whatever and uh so having these emerging technologies really allows us to identify areas that are maybe more resilient or resistant to a changing climate and that once we find those places or find specific species or whatever, we can then, you know, to hand that over to policymakers and decisions to say, Hey, these areas are really important. These are, these is your reserve for future coral populations or these somehow this area seemed to, to really weather and survive the last coral bleaching event. Like we need to carve out this area and we need to protect it or we need to monitor or pay attention. And, and it's these, again, these emerging technologies that allows us to do that on a way that we can never been do before. So, um, so I, I am really excited to be to be getting involved in that type of research. It's an, ex it's an exciting time for science. Yeah, it is absolutely. Like yeah. I said, it's like you're. It's a weird thing to. <laughs> it is a weird thing to say, but I will say that I'm I'm generally an optimist, uh, you know, and both, uh, you know, um, both is just you know in my personal nature. But but even as a scientist, I do I look out on a seascape and I and I can see. The fact that there are still live corals, there are still fish, there are still lots of healthy aspects of different ecosystems that that are worth putting our energy to understanding and understanding why they're still there or understanding, you know, like I said, the things that make them resistant to, you know, large marine heat waves. Uh, and, and then I think that that will really provide us information to find those areas and protect them. So uh, I, while coral reefs and other ecosystems, I think, will will be changing as as the climate changes there's no question about that um i think what they look like 20 30 40 years from now will will be very much dependent on what we do as a society in the next decade uh but you know i'm optimistic that 
especially given what's been happening around the world in terms of climate change activism and, and so on and so forth. I think that um, I do believe that policymakers have the ability to, to make the, the, the policies change that is needed and, and that we can potentially really at least um, not head down to, to this like apocalyptic, apocalyptic path that, that feels like we could be and that ecosystems will, will adapt and respond to that. Um, I don't want to be overly optimistic here. We are fundamentally, um, climate change is the single greatest threat to our planet and our well-being, with, without a doubt. And, and I say that from as a scientist. Um, but again, the impacts are, are, are I think, f not fully realized. And I think that um, as we move down this road, uh, there is, there is um, cause and reason for hope and optimism that, that these ecosystems will persist. What other technologies are you using or what other ways are you engaging like citizens to, to be a part of um, all this work that you're doing? Yeah, so um, this summer, uh, around Hawaii, we experienced a, a really large marine heat wave. So ocean temperatures were an upwards of three, four degrees Fahrenheit above what we would typically expect. And, and so, and and just writ large, the ocean has absorbed like ninety three percent of the heat, the excess heat in the atmosphere, right? Right. And but you know, so in general, ocean temperatures across the globe are increasing. But um, there are you know, there's other factors that will superimpose or, or sort of be on top of general ocean warming. And so these, these things are seasonal cycles. Um, and then in this case, we had uh, what we would call large marine heat wave for much of the Northeast Pacific. Um, so basically north of Hawaii over across, um, you know, California and so on and, and northward up to Alaska. The ocean was, was much, much warmer than it typically is. And the physics behind that is super complicated, but basically winds died for an extended period of time. There's very little wind. And so when there's no wind, the ocean surface heats up, um, to, to put it most simplistically. And so around that affected conditions around here. And like I said, things were, you know, two, three, four degrees Fahrenheit above what we would typically expect. And when it gets that warm, uh, corals kind of stress out and it induces something called coral bleaching. And so coral bleaching is the breakdown of that symbiotic relationship we talked about earlier. And so because because algae provides the color for corals, once that algae leaves, corals are just white. They're just calcium carbonate. So it looks like you've poured a bleach all over the coral head. And um, and for the first time, uh, we partnered, NOAA partnered with the state, as well as, um, uh, funny enough, uh, ASU, Arizona State University. Uh, they have some emerging technologies where they're using satellite data to try and track bleaching in real time, which has never been done before. So wow. we could basically get a map every week um, for the entire state of Hawaii as corals are paling. And but the satellites and that's because the satellites can see but beneath the surface of the ocean. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's not a predictive thing. They're actually seeing they're actually it. seeing. Wow. So we ha we have satellite data that can look at ocean temperature, which is which is a predictor for coral bleaching, but it's not a, it's not a one-to-one -one by any means. Um, there's lots of areas where it's super hot and corals aren't bleaching and vice versa. Um, so this is the first time uh, in, in that partnership that we were able to use satellites and track it through time. However, we weren't really sure, um, you know, the satellites were detecting changes and detecting this whitening of corals, but we weren't sure how, what those changes were and how white they were, for example. So we, at the same time, um, we developed something called the Coral Tracker, hawaiicoral.org, and it allowed people, anybody underwater, to basically, on their smartphone, say, yes, I, I've, I saw bleaching here or here or here. And you can even, there was even a, um, there was three different severities, you know, one being just barely pale and, you know, basically mild, medium, and, and extreme. And, uh, and it, hundreds of people, um, scientists, citizens, you know, surfers, uh, ended up, documenting on hawaiicoral.org which is that's also the first time that's ever really been done and while there's been some you know there's um there's a couple of the other local organizations that have used citizen science uh they provided they required some training or a little bit more information this was just hey if you were underwater and you saw something can you just put this on your phone and log it and uh and so what it allowed us to do was help calibrate what the satellites were seeing with what uh, was being reported oh, by okay. by local community members. So not only was that I think a really important way by people could um, could actually look underwater and feel like they're contributing something and actually 
a lot of surfers in particular don't really put their head under water very often, right? <laughs> Uh, so I, I think that it allowed citizens to get involved and to contribute to something. And, and importantly, it was actually scientifically meaningful. This wasn't just an exercise to say, Hey, go out and, right. and log this for us. It was, it really allowed us to, we, for example, we got a couple of, um, a couple of reports that seemed like there was some, some really important, um, bleaching going on in certain areas. And so what we did as scientists would take those reports and then go and follow up and, and help validate them. And a lot of them were spot on. So people, I think people are really good at, you know, white is not a natural color underwater. Yeah. You just don't see too many things that are white. So, right. um, you know, and you can see coral bleaching from above, you know, just even, you know, paddling, right? Uh, so I think a lot of people contributed and it was actually really critical for both from an outreach perspective, but also from, again, like sort of a scientific validation story as well. That's great. And is it still live today? Yeah, still live today. And those um, satellite maps that I mentioned, uh, you can actually see them. So you can uh, you can see where coral bleaching is is was greatest around the state, and then you can actually compare that with where people um, documented coral bleaching as well. Awesome. We can link to that in the show notes as well. Yep, absolutely. I guess, especially since since I've been focusing on the plastics work, I feel like the question always comes up, well, what can we do? And same with the climate change. And yeah. It, it does, especially climate change. It feels like this just behemoth. It just feels like this insurmountable like hill to climb. And, and what do we do? What can we do? And and I think that as cheesy as it sounds, you know, the decisions we make on a day-to-day basis absolutely win some total over our life and win some total over the entire human population make a giant difference. And uh, so what we do does matter. And I, I feel like, you know, whether you're talking about your climate footprint, you know, making different decisions on on your diet for example or the number of flights you take or whatever all that adds up and it matters same to be the products that you use and whether you're getting you know your vegetables from your local csa or somewhere where it's wrapped three times in plastic you know that those decisions you know small and subtle on on the day-to-day do when integrated over time matter a lot and so i think people should take ownership of those decisions and live deliberately and know that the things that they do matter Super well said. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Dr. Jameson Gove, thanks for being here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Reese. And thanks for all the work that you do for the ocean. Happy to do it. I bet you never thought you'd hear two grown men talk about how cute baby swordfish are. And if you don't believe us, then I implore you to go check the show notes for links to the imagery from his research. Seriously, baby swordfish, super cute. Okay, thanks to Jamie for sitting down with us and for all the important research you do. And thanks to Noah, where Jamie works. Seriously, Noah supplies all of us with so much valuable information. If you meet someone from Noah, then you need to thank them for their service in science. That's all we've got for this week. Uh, Until next time, we'll see you then. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for all the WSL action. Click right here to subscribe, right here to watch more videos, and be sure to hit that like button.